Thank you very much for having me here tonight. I'm really happy and really honored to be in such a beautiful place that I have admired for such a long time. I'll just make a brief introduction for those who don't speak English and then we'll go, and then we'll go back to English. Boa noite. Recentemente fui eleita deputada federal por São Paulo. Estou muito feliz de estar aqui com vocês essa noite. Para mim é uma grande honra poder estar em um teatro tão bonito e tão importante para a história do nosso país. Como esse é um evento internacional que conta com a participação de pessoas dos mais diversos países, a gente vai fazer a fala em inglês, mas quem não puder acompanhar e quiser conversar depois, eu fico à disposição, combinado? Então, voltando para o inglês. So, I just said that uh, I'm an education activist. My name is Tava Tamaral. I was just recently elected a federal deputy. So, I've been a congresswoman for two months and a half, with a, with a very brief time. And I would like to start our conversation by asking the following question. Do you believe, given your experience with schools, universities, and society in general, do you believe that we are preparing our children our youth to the future? Well, I agree with you. I don't think we are. And many scholars who are dedicated to study the future of education or the future of labor relations have said that the next generation who are going to be adults in one, two, or three decades at maximum will face three challenges about which they will think every single day. The first one is climate change. And I am sure that not only we can see that this is already happening, that the climate change process has started by the race in temperature, but also when we see how many catastrophes have become more and more frequent in the world. I don't know if you knew that, but the rate of children that have asthma is already starting to increase due to climate change. And as always, this is impacting first the poorest communities, but many studies have shown that with the passing of years, more and more people be impacted by climate change. The second problem of the very near future is increasing inequality. Inequality has been increasing in Brazil for the last years, but it has also been increasing globally. And many economists believe there are no reason for us to think that this process will stop at some point or even reverse. And the third biggest challenge that the future generation is going to face is mass unemployment. And I would like to delve into the, this problem a little bit more. I don't know if you knew that, but the decade that went from 2000 to 2010 was the very first decade in the known history of humanity that zero jobs were created. So when you consider the number of jobs that were created due to innovation and so on, and the, num the number of jobs that were erased, and you do the math, you see that zero jobs, zero net jobs were created in 10 years. And this was the first time, as we know, that it happened in the humanity history. And if you start making the math, and you calculate how many people were born in this period, and how much the world population increased between the year 2000 and the year 2010, you see that mass unemployment has already started. There is a study made by Oxford professors that predicts that in the next 11 years, 11 years, it's very soon, it will come um, very fast. In the next 11 years, 2 billion jobs will be erased. So I'm not only saying that we have stopped creating new jobs, but I'm also telling you that the prediction for the next one decade is very, very scary. We are going to lose 2 billion jobs in a world that currently has 7 million people. And to finish, we know that AI, machine learning, big data, and so on, have started to change a lot of labor relations. And I would like to make a pause here. Those three problems that I brought to you, climate change, increasing inequality and mass unemployment are somehow related to all the technological revolution that we are currently living. And I know that this technological revolution has brought a lot of advances to society,
But I do think that it's urgent for us now to make a pause in our conversations and talk about those problems and talk about the not so bright future that the technological revolution is going to bring us. And there is a second thing that are common to those three problems. They are related to the technological revolution, but they, only, they can only be solved globally. No single country, no single society, no single group of politicians can decide to solve climate change by themselves, increase inequality or mass unemployment. Those three problems have to be solved globally. And that by itself brings a lot of challenges, as you might be used to it. And we are here today, and we, you all have a lot of experience, not only with education, but also with putting people from different cultures, from different countries, to get together, to have a real conversation, and to start thinking about solutions. So I just wanted to make sure that in the following days, as you are presenting your experience, as you are talking about the challenges you are facing, you make sure to talk about those three problems. They are knocking on our doors, they will be here before we know it, and if we really want to prepare the, few, the leaders of tomorrow, the next generation, not only to have a decent life, but also to be able to be protagonists in the world they are going to face, we have to talk about those problems now. And I really could not think of a better place for us to start this conversation. We need people from different countries to get together and talk about it, to have a solution mindset. And I'm sure that that's all pretty much you do every day. So I'm so happy to be here today. And as though this might sound a little bit weird or like a futuristic conversation, I do hope you take it as seriously as I do every day because it is very scary. And I know that we are talking about the future and that's how I want to start our conversation. But I think it's important for us to measure how fast we have to go to talk about the present. I'm going to give you some data, some examples about Brazilian education, but I'm sure you can relate to education in your country as well. As we speak now, seven out of ten adults in Brazil are not fully literate. So I'm basically saying to you that 70% of the adult population in Brazil cannot comprehend texts that are not too simple. So seven out of ten people, and I want to make it very, very clear that that's what I mean, are excluded for basically everything in society that requires you to be fully literate. And when we talk about the generation that is in school right now, the scenario is not so much more positive. About six out of 10 young uh, people in Brazil get to the end of high school, finish high school with the correct age. My father used to tell me when I was very small that back in his time, public schools were only for the elite in Brazil. And he was right. And that's why he didn't go to school himself. But the sad thing is that even though Brazil has been able to put pretty much everyone in the first years of basic education in school, we haven't been able to solve the problem of school evasion. And we also haven't been able to solve the problem of the quality of education. I already told you that about 60 out of 10 students finish high school in the right, with the correct age. But each, if we take 10 students that finish public high schools in Brazil, out of 10, only three have learned the basics of Portuguese. And out of 10, only one has learned the basics of math. So for you to finish high school in Brazil, fully literate, no infractions, when you are about 17, 18 years old, that basically means that you belong to a small, very tiny percentage of our population in Brazil. So I just showed you how challenging the future is. And I'm showing you how bad our current situation also is. But I would like to give you some political context. And I do hope you understand what I mean. Our last elections, I would say, were the most polarized elections that Brazil has seen in the last decades. And from both sides, you saw a lot of hatred, you saw a lot of fake news, but you saw very few policies being promised. And we just had a major crisis in our Ministry of Education because the past Minister of Education devoted all his time and all his work 
to persecute what he called a culture of Marxism. And I don't care if you are from left or from right right now. But I do care that, and that's my point here, if you allocate the whole time and all of the resources we have in an ideological fight, in an ideological war here, we are not trying to solve any of the problems that we currently discuss. And we just had a switch in our ministry, so now we have someone who has a lot of knowledge in management, and I think that's a great thing because he is starting the year three months and a half late, so he has a huge challenge, and for you to have an idea, most of the evaluations in Brazil, such as the one that students use to apply to universities, are in danger somehow. I don't know if you have heard of a name, that's the exam that our students take in order for them to apply to public schools and even to some private universities, that is in danger. And so is with other evaluations we have in Brazil. Many of the projects at MEC, our Ministry of Education, are also paralyzed. I'm talking about the implementation of the new curriculum, I'm talking about the new teacher's training program that uh, started a conversation last year, just to give some examples. And to finish, we have a national funding program called FUNDEB that is responsible for 60% of the funding of our basic education and that is going to expire next year. And the new Minister of Education haven't started already to talk about renovating this funding, which is fundamental to make sure that we have the funding needed to have a, pub a good public education for all. And I just brought those issues to say that I do think that one of the major problems we are facing the whole world, and it's not particular to Brazil, is the current uh, political polarization. I was lucky enough, after many opportunities, to attend college at Harvard, and I had a professor called Steven Levinsky, who I admire very much. And he recently uh, wrote a bestseller called How Democracies Die. And in his book, he makes the case, after talking about many countries, that worse than have an autocratic leader being elected to power is to have a very polarizing society. And he makes the point that polarization itself is a great danger to democracies worldwide. So I think this is also a moment for us to make another pause and talk about the political polarization that we are seeing in the world. I just gave you very practical examples talking about the Brazilian educational system of how this polarization coming from both the left and the right are putting on stop, on hold, major public policies in the country. And I think many of you can relate to what I'm saying. And to conclude, since my time is a little bit short, I'd just like to share with you a little bit of what made of me an education activist, because it has a lot to do with the work you do. So hopefully I can say thank you to all of you and also to share a little bit about how I, with 25 years old, end up in the Brazilian Congress. So I am from Sao Paulo. To those who don't know it, it's really nice and I love it, so here's an invitation. I come from the periphery of Sao Paulo, so I live an hour and a half from the city center in what we called to be an occupied region, so like illegal, um, and illegal areas. My father was a bus fare collector, my mom was a house cleaner, a salesperson, and many things more, because she's a very strong woman. And I used to study in state public schools until I was in sixth and seventh grade, and I had my very, very first opportunity with a math Olympiad. I don't know if you have heard of them, but in 2005, we, have, we had our first edition of our national math Olympiads, for students from public schools, which my opinion was a great idea. And due to one teacher, a math teacher, that decided to help me in the weekends, I was a medalist in that year, and then the following year, and got a scholarship in a very good private school in the center of Sao Paulo, one hour and a half away from my home. And I think the best summary I can make of that transition, those three hours that I was in a bus every day, was that this was the very first time in my life in which someone asked me if I was going to attend college. The question came a bit differently with all the students asking me what I was going to be, 
what I was going to pursue in college, and I had no idea. And I had no idea, not because I thought college was too hard, or not really for someone like me, but I had no idea because no one had talked about it to me before. So I basically didn't know that someone who came from where I come could attend college. And when you are 14, 15 years old, you have to have an answer to everything, otherwise you don't fit in. So I started saying that I wanted to become an astrophysicist. I had no idea what astrophysicists did back then, but I had taken a Astronomy Olympiad, which I thought was very cool, so I was like, okay, I'm going to be a scientist. Throughout those years, I was reminded many times that I was a girl, because all the students would say that I was too good in science to be a girl, or that I was too girly to be good in science. So girls in science should be also another topic for conversation. But I ended up going to five international Olympiads in the Brazilian team. I did chemistry, astrophysics, a lot of things, nothing related to politics, and I was really sure that I was going to be a scientist. And then I decided, due to the inspiration of many people, that maybe I should pursue college somewhere else. We do have astrophysics as a major in Brazil, and after going to so many countries, not speaking English, but meeting people from so many amazing places, I want to study abroad. And then I started receiving the help of many people, one of whom I know is represented here with Education USA, who started telling me that maybe I could study in the US, even though I didn't speak English at the time. I took an English course for one year. After talking to many people, I was able to get a scholarship, even though I had studied English for many years at school. You don't learn English at public schools in Brazil. And then I took this course for a year. Of course, I didn't learn English. And as you can see, there are marks of that experience up to today. But I decided that I could learn to take the test. So I took, I took many SITs, I took many TOEFLs. I tried the first time, I didn't get the minimum score. I tried the second time, I got the minimum score. And I applied to American universities. And I didn't know that would succeed. Actually, I thought that it was a very crazy idea of mine. But I had learned in that private school with people that really, especially teachers, who believed, believed in me that I should try at least. And I started studying physics at USP. That was the closest we had to astrophysics in Brazil. Until March 2012, I got an email from Harvard saying that I was accepted. For me, it was so hard to believe that that was true that I called the university to ask if it was a prank. I didn't know how to explain what pegadinha or all the words you have in Portuguese meant, but I thought they understood it's like, no, you are actually accepted, and you are the first one to ask if it was a break. So presidents <laughs> always make history. I saw it was true. I called my parents. My father said that he knew that was going to happen because he was as a dreamer as I am. My mom was really scared with the news, and then I celebrated for four days. After four days, we lost my father to drug addiction. And I also bring that to the conversation because especially in neighborhoods like the one in which I live, cracking has become a bigger and bigger issue. And I have already lost many friends and neighbors to drug addiction, to crime, to violence. And when that happened to my father, I was so sure that it was my fault. So sure that that was life showing me that someone like me didn't just go to Harvard, that I said no to Harvard and to other five universities who had accepted me. I also left USP, the Universidade of São Paulo, and just kept working because my mom was also unemployed. Some days, weeks, and months passed, and I was very sure that I was not going anywhere because life had made sure that I understood where my place was until my, my school, in which, I had been, uh, in which I had had a scholarship, called me and said, if you don't go, listen to that, like that's your responsibility. If you don't go, it will take many, many more years for someone to the peri from the periphery, as we say in Brazil, to get accepted to Harvard. And that's going to be your fault. And that was a very hard thing to take on yourself when you were like 18 years old. And then after some time, I decided to go. I submitted my yes to Harvard one hour before the, the very last deadline. 
I was sure I was going to hate university, and I did hate it the first year. It took me one year to learn English. I learned basically with my friends from India, that's why I have an India accent sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're always like, why is she speaking like that? <laughs> so it took me one year to learn English. I had to work, whereas many of my friends didn't have to. I was doing my astrophysics course, but I was not exactly loving that until in the end of my last year at Harvard, I took a course in government, Comparative Politics of Latin America. And that course did so well in explaining why I was there, choosing my future, choosing my career, and so free, while so many of my friends had died when they were 14, 15, and 16, that I thought that made more sense for me. I wanted to study something that related to my life. Even though I love cosmology a lot and I celebrated the black hole that you all just saw the picture, but I wanted to be more connected to my community as well. And so I switched my major to government, and now I have a minor in astrophysics, and started to go really deep in education, because I knew that I was there because of education. But I also knew that my father wasn't there anymore because of the opportunities that he never had, and he never did more. I started working with education, I worked in secretaries of education as a teacher, social movements, even when I graduated, I came back to Brazil because I knew that was the path. And after, which is now, nine years working with education and social projects and social movements, I started realizing that we would never change education if we didn't change our politics and if we didn't change our politicians, to be more sincere. And that's how I ended up working in social movements of political renovation. And that's how last year, in July, which was really late, I decided to run a campaign. It was the first time I ever affiliated to a party. It was the first time I ever ran a campaign. I had no experience, and my team also didn't have any experience. But many people saw some truth in what we were doing. I had over 5,000 volunteers, which is a lot very hard to manage, but we did it. I had over 400 donations, which is also very uh, uncommon in Brazil. And I think it talks a little bit about how we trying to make up with the collective. I didn't have the experience, I didn't have the big money, but I had many people working it. And I was the sixth most voted uh, federal deputy in my state and the second most voted uh, woman in the country to the Brazilian Congress. And when this all happened, I was really scared because now I'm the second youngest in Congress and I never had um, a friend, a family member, or someone that I knew in politics. And I always thought that that place was not for us. And even today, when I'm in plenary, as we call it, many people start a conversation with me, basically asking if I own anything as a business, if my parents are important somehow, if I am married or not, and when the person finds out that I will be here because I really believe in education, because I have known very well the two extremes of our inequality, some people don't believe it, but it's okay, we still work. So I told you all of that, just to say that the work you do, whereas it is putting people to know other cultures, putting people to get to know that they can dream, dream bigger, that they can do more than the people around there are doing. When you expose people to other realities, which I never saw living in the periphery of Sao Paulo, you are actually making this world a little bit better. And when you realize that you have all this power of connecting people from different cultures, of showing to them how big this world is, when you put them together and they're able to bring solutions, you might be in a much better position than our politics is today of trying to tackle those problems that I just talked to you about. And I do know that this is also my job and I don't want to take myself out of this. And I do believe that I need to help prepare our youth to this future. I need to prepare our future leaders, our citizens, to be able to deal with climate change, increase inequality, and mass unemployment. But I do know that this has to be a shared mission. The time we have is very little. It's a very urgent matter, and if we don't have universities, society, the public sector working together globally, this cannot be done only in a country anymore. If we don't put all our best minds to think about this, 
we won't be there on time. That will be too late. And I do hope this doesn't help happen. And that's why I was so happy to be here today. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much for the work you do. And I do hope I was able to change the conversation a tiny little bit. So thank you.